We need to talk. You've done something wrong. Okay. I'm toast. Now, I'm not upset. I'm upset. I'm just kind of surprised. I'm a ticking time bomb of volcanic and fury. Because you forgot about yesterday? Because you are a moron of epic proportions. Yesterday, yesterday. I'm toast. Yesterday was the 15th anniversary of our first official date. Oh, that's right, I remember. I have no memory of that. Do I need to get some flowers or something? No. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. No. Are you mad? No. Yes. You'll remember next year. I will. I won't. So how do you like the casserole? It's, uh, it, it's a new flavor. It tastes like the devil ate a skunk sandwich and vomited in my mouth. That's my mom's favorite recipe. I grew up on that. Might as well slap my mother in the face. Well, you know I would never do that. You know I think your mother's wonderful. Actually, I think your mother's a... So? Want to have sex? How was your day? Want to have sex? Exhausting. Don't even think about it, you sex maniac. Exhausting, huh? Want to have sex? Exhausting. I'd rather rub broken glass in my eyes. Do you want to cuddle? Want to cuddle for two seconds, then have sex? My head hurts. You lay one finger on me, and I'll beat you with this lamp, you filthy McNasty. OK. Good night. How about now? You want to have sex now? Well, good morning, everybody. You enjoyed that, didn't you? So this weekend, we're going to talk about sex. Who'd like to share first? Anybody. So we are going to talk about sex because we should not be ashamed to talk about what God was not ashamed to create. And we are in a series these days on relationship and on marriage and what that looks like. And a big part of who we are as sexual beings uh, is this expression of physical intimacy. Now, some of you are surprised that the Bible has anything to say about sex, actually a lot. Uh, and you evidently haven't read Song of Songs recently in the Old Testament. Some of you giggling obviously have, which tells me you enjoyed it. That's actually going to be the homework assignment for everybody to read Song of Songs before we meet again next weekend, but I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. I'm actually feeling pretty good right now uh, as a uh, pastor and teacher uh, of the Bible because I feel like I have good odds at actually keeping your attention for the next 30 minutes and not losing you due to disinterest. Here's where my heart and head are at, and this is important that you know this, uh, relative to sexuality. If the local church is not speaking and teaching about the beautiful gift of sexuality, then who's going to? By default, who are we allowing to be the informing voice of our children and our culture? I mean, it's multiple public forums, it's the schools, it's Planned Parenthood, it's the pornographers. By the way, pornography is a $20 billion a year industry uh, all over the internet. See, everybody's talking about sexuality uh, except the church. And by default, our children are hearing the wrong voices. Again, I say that we should not be ashamed to talk about and have conversations about you and I what God was not ashamed to create. So the church, in a very real sense, needs to reclaim its right uh, to speak on this topic of sex with truth and honesty and humility and grace and joy and purity. And among the many reasons why, here's the big reason why. Because most of us would say uh, we have a personal relationship with the God that created sex and have an understanding that Father knows best. One other thing I want to add by way of what's going on in my heart. Whenever uh, I teach on the weekend and I consider it a very sacred and a humbling entrustment from God, I realize that a percentage of the time and on a topic like this, a huge percentage of the time, 
what the Bible teaches about sexuality and what our culture is teaching about sexuality are diametrically opposed. I don't mean just a little bit off by degrees, I mean a full 180. And so what I'm saying today, I realize, and by the way, I'm not manufacturing stuff, I'm just a conduit, I'm just communicating in ways that I hope are loving and humble and relevant, uh, the truth of God's word to a 21st century Bay Area audience. Uh, but I want you to know I'm fully aware, and by the way, fully informed of the values, the principles, kind of the sacred things, the social mores relative to what our culture is saying uh, at large about sexuality. Uh, among those, for example, I, I do a huge amount of reading. Uh, Time Magazine, uh, a few weeks ago, came out with an article suggesting that actually there are probably up to 17 different genders. Now, I say that with kindness, I say that with humility, there's not any sort of subterranean animosity about that. We're not even sure in our culture these days what a gender is, what a man is, what a woman is. And so we, uh, in some sense, are kind of in a place of debate and confusion and uncertainty about things that have not been a challenge for us uh, in much of our existence as a community of peoples. In terms of relevance, can you think of a topic more relevant? I mean, for those of you that are believers uh, in Jesus, so let me ask you a, a question. How often do you think about the rapture of the church, the millennial reign of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the new heavens, the new earth, all those really awesome eschatological end times moments? You believers, I'm asking you, do you think about that once a month? Some of you maybe twice a month, some of you two or three times a year. If I asked you same people, indeed the whole house today, how often do you think about sex? I'd say about every hour, maybe twice an hour. If you're a teenage boy between the age of about 12 and 19, probably 25 times an hour, okay? <laughs> so I simply say that uh, this is incredibly relevant and God wants men and women to rejoice in their sexuality find it deeply fulfilling and meaningful in the context of marriage. Um, one young husband and wife were talking uh, in their new marriage about what their sexual future looked like together as husband and wife. Uh, you'd be surprised, by the way, how few married couples actually have meaningful, uh, genuinely honest, transparent conversations. I mean, we plan our 401ks, retirement investments, our vacations, car payments, our kids' schooling opportunities post high school, and we hardly say anything to each other uh, about this really, really important part of who we are uh, as a married couple. Anyhow, this young couple was talking and the wife began the conversation. She said, sweetheart, how often, honestly, in our marriage would you like to make love? And he thought, that's so nice of her to ask. And he thought about it for a moment. And he responded, well, honey, I suppose every day that begins with a T. And she thought about that. And she said, okay, so Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, that sounds reasonable. I'm good with that. He said, no, no, not just Tuesdays and Thursdays, but today and tomorrow also, <laughs> also, Tatterday and Tunday, okay? <laughs> I bring that up because even in committed married relationships, there are different degrees of passion and need and desire and those kinds of things. And unless we talk about those, we're almost certain to have a miss. We're almost certain to have some kind of a disconnect which will polarize and alienate over the long haul, right? And I don't, I don't think we wanna live that way. Now let's go back to the source. If we believe God's created us in his image, if we believe he's created us also as sexual beings, right? Let's see what the Bible has to say about it. So take the notes you received uh, when you came in. Which are available uh, both in hard copy and there's an online version on you version. And let's read from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, uh, different select verses from chapters one through four. I've got it listed there for you. I'm gonna read it to you. You follow along for some of you. This is reinforcement of what you've long read and believed. Uh, for others of you in the house, this may be first time exposure uh, to these understandings. And I read, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. 
and the man became a living being. So God created mankind in his own image. and the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, wow, God. But not really. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this meet reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, notice, both naked, and they felt no shame. We'll come back to that momentarily. Final verse, and Adam lay with his wife Eve. The idea of lay is a biblical euphemism for sexual intimacy. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth. Now, I want you to notice in verse number 25 the idea of no shame. They're both naked, and they enter into sexual relationship as man and woman, husband and wife, with no shame. And I bring that up because what we are finding as shepherds of souls in this local church, in this region, in this day and age, that there actually is an awful lot of shame and guilt and pain and confusion and even anger. Uh, I don't know where you're coming from today. Uh, maybe you have shame because you look at yourself as physically an unattractive person. Maybe you are a person that even talking about this topic is like chewing gravel uh, because you are a victim of abuse growing up. And this is a honestly just a horrid, dirty topic to you. Uh, for some of you, you might be having quite a bit of guilt because you've chosen to live a life of sexual promiscuity. You know, to use, borrow the country song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places, you say, John, those lyrics could have been written about the last 10 years of my life. Uh, for some of you, you grew up in a home where sex is dirty and not to be talked about and maybe only whispered behind closed doors and there was a sense of shame and foreboding kind of uh, just not good vibe about the whole thing. Uh, one of Satan's tricks is to take the good things of God and pervert them, twist them, corrupt them, uh, take them to extremes that God never intended. And he does that with sexuality also. And so in our hearts, there may be humiliation, there may be embarrassment, maybe disgrace, maybe shame. Um, I want us to leave our gathering here in a few minutes with a newfound sense of freedom and wholeness and guilt-free and a new beginning in this part of our lives. Some of you backpacked into the house this weekend, heavy loads. I want you to walk out free and becoming whole men and women. Again, we should not be ashamed to talk about you and I, what God was not ashamed to create. Now, number one, why did God create sex? Fill it in real quick. For unity. For unity. Did you notice Ephesians 5.31? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. Men, we have to leave. And notice, leave and cleave or be united. The man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And notice the definition of this union. The two become one flesh. Five times that very statement appears in the Bible. Part of who God created us to be in his image is as sexual beings, and this is not embarrassing. It's beautiful. And if you've not come to that understanding yet, that's the kind of a direction I'm hoping your sexual sort of self-assessment will move toward. So the married sexual expression between a husband and wife creates a bond, a one flesh union. And I say this truth with uh, clarity, that a marriage will never reach its full potential, never, until the couple is regularly enjoying a mutually satisfying sexual relationship in that marriage, in which the two actually are becoming one. Secondly, why did God create sex? For pleasure. Fill that in, for pleasure. 
Again, this is like swallowing gravel to some of you who grew up with the idea that sex was dirty and evil and something to be just sort of, you know, endured. Uh, I, I add to that line that God actually created sexual pleasure. He did. The Bible's very clear about that, and I might add, without which, the human race would quickly become extinct. Hello. So God created sexual pleasure. Notice what the Bible says in Proverbs 5. Be happy, and this is an encouragement to men. Rejoice in your wife. Let her tender embrace satisfy you. Let her love alone fill you with delight. Guys, um, we are doing a lot of wandering these days. And if not in actuality, in our eyes, in our mind, and in our hearts. And I need every man in the house to look at me for just a moment because I want to give you a homework assignment. And this is for men only. I mean, ladies, you can read it if you want, but I need every guy to read this before you show up next weekend, okay? Proverbs chapters 5, 6, and 7, the whole chapters. There is no more explicit chapters in the Bible to men which deal with the upside of expressing our sexuality in wholesome ways that honor God and bring great pleasure and contentment and the pain when we choose to sexually color outside the lines. And so guys, Proverbs chapter five, six, and seven, I think every man ought to make that part of sort of his spiritual menu, his spiritual diet, so that you really get a grip. It's graphic, it's to the point, and it speaks to the masculine soul. Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. You'll be glad you read it, guys. So God says that he created sex for pleasure between the man and the woman, the husband and the wife, for the mutual enjoyment of both, and that it's a wonderful gift. So I would say, hear this, that physical, sexual, and sensual pleasure in marriage is not a sin and not something to be grimly endured. It is good. It is good. It is good. And I'm going to add another word. I want to raise the bar a little bit more. It is F-U-N, fun. If you haven't discovered that marital intimacy, sexual intimacy with your mate is fun, uh, you need to have a conversation. We are so uh, ensnared with past pain or legalism or misinformation and we're just tied up in knots. We need to be free in God also in this part of our lives. We are sensual beings in the sense that God's given us five senses. One of those five senses is touch. And I thank God for the sensation of touch and the joy and pleasure that brings to our life. And I want to set some of you free. The Bible says that when we begin our relationship with God, we become what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. And God's Spirit dwells within us. So when a husband and wife are about to have a moment of marital intimacy and enjoy their sexual relationship with one another, I want you to know, don't want to hurt your feelings or freak you out, God is there. You may be embarrassed to hear that. God is not embarrassed to hear that. He's not watching you in your bedroom saying, oh my God, oh my me, they're about to do it. Oh, I can't take this. Are they doing it yet? I mean, God's not doing that. He is saying about us the same thing that he said about Adam and Eve that first time when the man and the woman came together in that first marriage and were sexually intimate. God said, it is good. Some of you grew up in homes where sex was no, 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 no. Dirty, 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 dirty. Sin, 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 sin. Evil, 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 evil. And then you get engaged. And then on your marriage night, your honeymoon night, you're supposed to flip the switch and be able to go from all that 20 years or 25 years or 30 years of uh, kind of you know, psychological embedding to all of a sudden being free and whole and expressive sexually, it doesn't work that way. So parents, I caution you to think about the kinds of messages, verbal and particularly nonverbal, that we send to our children. I say this by way of fact. Keep in mind that the most important part of our sexual expression, uh, it has nothing to do with our anatomy. It's what's most important is the brain. 
It's the most significant in our spirit as human beings. We are spiritual beings. And when we're tied up in knots mentally and psychologically and emotionally, it's hard for us to be free and whole in sexual expression. So think about those things and uh, move intentionally to become whole in those areas of your life, even if you need an assist uh, from a, a counselor and, and so, okay? So the Bible says that God created our sexual gift for unity, for pleasure, and then thirdly, fill it in for children and a godly heritage. By the way, uh, as an aside on godly heritage, uh, you people evidently are taking to heart the idea where God said to Adam and Eve, uh, therefore multiply, fill the earth, and subdue, because this church family's having a lot of babies these days. And so we're not gonna be dedicating babies in our weekend gatherings anymore, because uh, there's too many to do a quality, relational job. Um, and so what we're doing is we're going to throw four to six parties a year. We just had one yesterday. Yesterday from two to four o'clock over here in these classrooms on this side, we had uh, 12 babies that we dedicated and almost a hundred family members and parents that showed up. I got to tell you, we had church. We had a party. We had a holy moment. We had a happy moment. There was all kinds of carrot cakes and desserts and coffees. We had a special area set out for families to get family pictures that were providing for each person that dedicated. Everybody that dedicated their children listened to six hours of videos. And so we really have invested in these families. I want you to know the best part about that was the spiritual legacy building I heard going on when each mother and father shared what the dedication of their son or daughter meant. And it's never too late to begin building a spiritual legacy with your sons and daughters. One of the babies that we dedicated yesterday was a 16-year-old young woman who is just moving into her senior year of high school. So it's never too late. We do children dedication or teen dedication, obviously, as well as baby dedication. Third reason that God created sexuality. Notice in Genesis 1, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Note to self, only one way that can happen. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, every living creature that moves on the ground. Did you know that our sexual expression is an incredible privilege for us to participate with God in the gift of creation? I will never forget the millisecond in my life four times when I held for the first time in my hands Caitlin, Ryan, Logan, and Candace. My life was changed. I was changed. And I was way too young and immature to be a dad, but here I was. And I had to go to school quick. There was a very steep learning curve, but it was a moment unlike any other. The sad thing for most couples, when we look at these three reasons for which God created the beautiful gift of sexuality, the only purpose of sex many marriages ever realize is this third purpose. In other words, they got kids to show for it but they've never understood the beauty of sexual intimacy in their marriage in reference to truly becoming one flesh, body, soul, and spirit, or just pleasure, sexual pleasure and fun. And I'm saying now that we understand there's these three reasons, here's an opportunity for us as husbands and wives to begin to move to a new level of intimacy and to have some conversations and to move towards health in this part of our lives as well. Let's begin to wrap up this morning with our second uh, question and our final insight for this weekend. Why should we save sex for marriage? In other words, we must talk for just a few moments about why God cautions us, because he loves us, not to color outside the lines with his sexual expression. Important principle. Please hear your pastor this morning. God has never given us any desire or passion without also providing for us a righteous context to express that passion or desire. Does that make sense? That's why God gave us marriage. So that we, with our husband or wife, could enjoy this beautiful part of who we are without shame, without guilt, without all the really painful consequences that come when we color outside the line sexually. 
So why did God give us sex for marriage to safeguard our highest earthly relationships? Fill this in, would you please? What are those highest earthly relationships? Marriage and family. Now here's the truth. Sex is powerful. Sex is very powerful. And that's why with this beautiful gift, this powerful gift, God is giving us healthy boundaries because he loves us. Not because he's vindictive, not because he's a cosmic killjoy, but because he loves us. He's saying, I've made you my sons and daughters, my children as sexual beings, And I've given you the righteous context in which for you to enjoy this beautiful part of who you are without shame, without guilt, without pain. Okay? Here's how clearly the Bible talks about it. Look at 1 Corinthians 6.18. Paul is writing to a church uh, in the nation of Greece in ancient Corinth. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This church actually happened to be a sexual circus. These people were inventing whole new ways to sin sexually, literally, literally. This is only 2,000 years before the internet. Paul writes, flee from sexual immorality. Time out, everybody look at me. What is sexual immorality? Most young adults in American culture don't know anymore, which let me give you a recent statistic that it's estimated by the most recent surveys that single adults in the church, unmarried single adults that are believers, 80% of them are sexually active. Okay, the Bible clearly speaks about that. Adultery isn't the only thing that God says, I love you so much, my child. Do not be unfaithful to your marriage vows. He's also saying, don't be unfaithful to your future mate by committing, the word is biblically, fornication. God is saying the only context for us to righteously and without guilt and shame express the joy of our sexuality is in the marriage relationship. Now, what we as human beings are looking for in a culture which is so sexually promiscuous, you know what one of the deepest yearnings of the human soul is? Intimacy. Uh, We are looking for intimacy and a deep, soulish connection with another human being. And we are thinking that sex will deliver that. And I want to say to you, uh, almost as a father figure in this context, who's watched thousands of young adults for 35 years, try it that way. I want to say to you, you won't be fulfilled. It'll be very painful to you. Uh, here's, Here's the reason. In our search for intimacy, it's much easier for us to bear our body than it is for us to bear our soul. That's the painful work. That's the scary work. Pretty easy, actually, to take our clothes off and hop into bed for another weekend fling and then somebody else the next weekend. But because we are beings that are body, soul, and spirit, uh, we do not go forward unaffected. Let me put it this way. Sex is like adhesive tape. Think of scotch tape. Scotch tape is designed for a single usage. So you want to tape something on the wall. You get a piece of tape, piece of paper, stick it on the wall and it holds. But if you pull that piece of paper with the tape off the wall to try to attach it to some other portion of the wall, it will probably stick, but it's not as sticky as it was the first time. By the time you've done that two times, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times, there is no sticky left at all. And that's the way that God has wired us sexually. That's why sex is so powerful, that they're no longer two, that they're one. There is a one fleshness. And notice the rest of this passage that we began in 1 Corinthians 6. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man or woman commits are outside their body. But he or she who sins sexually sins against our own body. And when we do that, we can deeply damage ourselves. And I don't think we want to do that to ourselves. Now, I want to hasten to add, 
if that has happened to you and you've chosen to go that way and now you're getting some new bits of information here this weekend together, you and I, and you're saying, okay, I'm gonna make some life readjustments. I'm, I'm not going forward in this way anymore because this is not working out. I want you to know you can bring yourself and whatever it is may be in your past to Jesus. And if you come with a humble spirit and an honest heart, I promise you he will forgive you. He will make you clean. He will make you whole. The Bible promises that, that if we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God is not wanting to condemn. He's wanting to forgive and set us free. I don't want anybody walking out of the house this weekend with shame and humiliation and guilt internally. If you walked in that way, in a few moments, I want you to walk out as free men and women. When we engage in sex outside of marriage, the Bible clearly teaches that it is a sin. And I don't know whether you're aware of this, but it actually affects five different things. First of all, the Bible teaches it's a sin against God. Secondly, the Bible teaches it's a sin against our spouse or, if we're single now, our future spouse. Remember, not just physically, but mentally, we will bring into our marriage bed everybody we've ever been with sexually. And I don't think we want that kind of mental, emotional, psychological baggage, do we? Thirdly, uh, we sin against our own body. You say, John, how does that happen? Well, we actually become one flesh with that person, and we invite into ourselves guilt, shame, venereal infection, unwanted pregnancy, the horrible decision of life or death to abort or not to abort, all of these things. There's a fourth one that we sin against, as it were, and that would be the church body. We in some way deeply damage the reputation of Jesus and the trust that our, our faith family, our spiritual family uh, has in us. And then number five, the other person that we're with, we are sinning against them as well. God actually wants to um, spare us this pain, and the Bible has a very clear definition of safe sex. I'm not gonna say it's popular, and I realize this flies completely in the face of conventional wisdom on what safe sex is and how to attain it, but this is what the Bible teaches, just so you know, and it's never changed. God says safe sex is abstinence before marriage and then faithfulness within marriage, and then in marriage, knock yourself out, have the time of your life, party, fun, pleasure, children, one flesh, all of that and more. Remember, he gives us righteous boundaries to express this beautiful gift of sexuality. Now, I wanna add one other thing you may not have uh, thought about, and it's this, that, do you know what the average age where American adults are marrying for the first time? Do you know what the average age is? Almost 30 years old. Okay, go to life development. Remember life development psychology and the things that you and I had growing up. When does our sexual motor really begin to develop? A puberty and emerging adolescence. So it can vary with boy to boy, girl to girl, usually a little earlier for girls, but by 10, 11, 12 certainly, by 13, 14, 15, 16, oh boy, Watch out, man, we are high-octane testosterone, estrogen, and every other kind of chemical not yet invented. Okay, we've all been there. We're all human beings together. So if we are in some sense at the height of spiritual, or rather sexual passion by, say, 15 years old and we're not marrying till we're 30, that means that's 15 years where we have to walk with sexual integrity. Now, I talk to hundreds of single adults and I hear this constantly, John, I can't control myself, I can't help it. Okay, now look at me. And this is not St. John talking to you, this is just a fellow human being in life's pilgrimage together, right? Yes, you can control it. Yes, you can. The Bible promises that, that no temptation has taken us or seized upon us, which is not common to everybody. And remember this, that when we begin our relationship with God, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, we become the temple of God, right? And what is one of the fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. 
It's that we're not allowing God to help us through these single years, this sexual wilderness, and we just enter into this sexual playground. I can't tell you last night after the first of our four weekend gatherings, how many people came and stood at front here and talked to me afterwards and saying, John, I have been with so many people, I can't even count anymore. I see people that I have not seen for years and they'll say to me, hey, remember when they, we had that? And you're going, actually, I don't. I was probably drunk that night or I, or there's just been so many since. It's just kind of a haze, okay? We don't wanna live that way. We wanna be whole, we wanna be free. We wanna have a clean conscience and a clean heart and we can walk with such sexual integrity before the Lord, uh, both before we're married and watch this, when we are married, Becoming married, if you have the wanderlust and you are just empowering sexual lust in your life, it will not diminish. Pretty soon you'll tire of your mate and your eyes will begin to wander. You'll make yourselves vulnerable. The workplace is a highly vulnerable place for sexual relationships to begin. I'm just talking to us about life and we're talking to this together. No, no anger here or no accusation, but we've gotta be real so that we express this beautiful part of who we are, our sexuality, in ways that are life-giving to us, honoring to the Lord, and deeply loving to our family and to our children. Uh, friends, there is a lot at stake here. Parents, I wanna to talk to you for just a moment. Go ahead and put it up on the big screen, would you? So we have a seminar coming up this upcoming Saturday. It is free. It's from 9.30 to 1.30 and lunch is provided. Again, it's free and it is called Empowered. Here's what we're finding. Uh, it is for parents, this seminar of toddlers, tweens and teens, so not just when your kids are teens, but when your kids are children. Do you know the average age of first exposure to pornography, okay, in America today? Between the ages of nine and 10 years old. So we are highly uh, intuitive about, as we care for parents and families uh, as your pastors, that parents think they're in touch, but they're often wildly out of touch and think that they have no control to protect their children's minds and hearts and their sexual gift from God, right? And so we're gonna help you understand uh, how to have a healthy talk with your children, teens, about their sexuality, about healthy relationships, what they are and what they are not, and the power, good and bad, of technology, and we have two tremendously informed uh, presenters. This Saturday is a gift to the parents of this church family. Please adjust your schedule, parents, and be here, okay? It'll really, really be helpful to you. Okay, last thing. When we say no to non-marital sex, we are saying yes to something far, far better because God always reserves his very best to those that leave the choice and the timing to him. Know this, he loves each one of us. And everybody said, stand to your feet, would you please? I told you that there's a homework assignment and the homework assignment, everybody, so men, you're doing Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, but everybody, yes, guys, this is a second homework assignment. Get over yourself, okay? This one you get to do with your wife if you're married. If not, read it anyhow. Uh, I want you to read the Song of Songs. It's a dynamic little eight-chapter book in the Old Testament. And actually, it'll make you blush just a little bit. It's good stuff. It's a story about the married love and the sexual love between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. And it's one of the beautiful books inspired by God in the Bible. So everybody, do your homework and read the Song of Songs for next weekend, okay? And then guys, add to that Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. Let's pray.